Hi everyone, welcome to part one of the 1920s. Our question to think about here, what were the components of the liberal image of the 1920s? When we take a look at the 1920s or we think back to the 1920s, a lot of people have this imagery that basically surrounds the Great Gatsby, right? That you have flappers and prohibition and speakeasies and all of this sort of energy and excitement of the jazz age. But as we're going to see in this topic, the way that I've arranged it is it's a dichotomy. On one side, we have the sort of liberal image of the 1920s. And then on the other side, we have kind of a reactionary reality of the 1920s. So we're going to start here with the liberal image that most people are familiar with. The 1920s are sometimes called the Roaring Twenties, and that is partly due to the booming economy. With the advent of new consumer goods industries, the American people by the 1920s enjoyed the highest standard of living of any nation on earth. After a brief post-war depression, 1922 saw the beginning of a great boom that peaked in 1927 and lasted until 1929. Industrial output nearly doubled, and the gross national product rose by 40%. The gross national product is the total value of goods produced and services produced by a country in one year. The most explosive growth took place in industries producing consumer goods, automobiles, appliances, furniture, clothing. Equally important, the national per capita income increased by 30% in 1929, and more Americans had more leisure times, time for things like spectator sports and amusement parks. One of the other components of the story of the 1920s involves changes in family dynamics. The growing affluence of America meant that fewer children were needed to work outside the home, thereby freeing them from a lot of responsibility. This means that more children were able to continue with their educations. It also means that some families were able to purchase their own homes rather than continuing to live with extended families. In addition, as couples had access to effective birth control methods, it enabled them to limit their number of children. Now keep in mind that conversations about birth control were, were illegal in most states. And that brings us to the story of Margaret Sanger, who was the founder of the organization that would eventually be renamed Planned Parenthood. She's not without controversy, but her crusade at the beginning of the 20th century was based on her experience growing up in a home with 11 children. Her mother had died young and left her in charge of her younger siblings. As a nurse, she often saw firsthand the connection between the number of pregnancies and the decline health of the mother. She was convinced that restrictions on birth control were intended to keep the mass of poor people poor. She was often arguing that working class women had no interest in issues outside the home because they simply didn't have the energy for it. Uh, but the prolonged adolescence of American children led to new strains on the family in the form of youthful revolts. One of the key components of the new affluence lay in technology. In particular, the moving assembly line pioneered by Henry Ford became a standard feature in nearly all American factories. And this led, this led to a huge increase in production. In fact, when we take a look at the automobile the automobile industry itself, production jumped from fewer than 2 million cars a year to more than 5 million by 1929. Ford's assembly lines were producing a new car every 93 minutes, and this is going to dramatically reduce the cost. The Model T that was produced in 1908 had a price tag of $850, which was well beyond the means of everyone except the wealthy. 
But in 1924, the cost was $290, and this was much more attainable for the average middle class family. The growth in the automobile industry led to the, the expansions in other industries, including steel, glass, rubber, oil drilling, and refining, and leather. But the automobile also had a profound effect on all aspects of American life in the 1920s. Gas stations are going to re replace the smithies and stables of the past. Roads expanded across the country, and we saw the emergence of roadside restaurants and hotels as individuals and families set off on road trips both short and long. Uh, some people criticized the automobile for its negative impact on society as some families skip church to go for a Sunday drive. Also, teenagers and young adults increasingly went driving without chaperones. An additional social impact is the fact that new suburbs are going to sprout on the outskirts of cities as more Americans are escaping the crowded, dirty cities for the lush green suburbs. With all of these consumer goods available, the advertising industry is going to boom. The 1920s saw the birth of what we might call modern advertising, and it by itself was big business. Advertising earnings rose from $1.3 billion in 1915 to $3.4 billion in 1926. And these advertising agencies are going to perfect some of the strategies that we can witness in our advers advertising today. One of the examples is playing on hopes or hopes and fears. So the idea that you don't want to look old, so you buy buy face cream and you color your hair or you hope to get a date so you buy this perfume or these clothes or you know you you wear this makeup another example is playing up brand names one of the best things that you can do is to make your brand name synonymous with the product itself so if we think about something in our world today like chapstick you know, if somebody's talking about they need some lip balm, they don't say lip balm, they say chapstick. And chapstick is a brand name. The same thing for Q-tips and Roombas and all kinds of things, rollerblades, hacky sacks. These are synonymous with the product. But there's another element here that's really profound, and that is the idea of planned obsolescence, which is designing things to go out of style. So if Henry Ford is worried that his sales have really plateaued, he takes a note from Paris dressmakers, and that is, if you change the style or the features or the form of the product, then you keep the consumer dissatisfied, that they always want the latest, greatest thing. Now, there are many examples of strategies within planned obsolescence, and one of them is to change the technological features, like with the iPhones changing the adapters, which mean you don't just need to change uh, your headphones, you need to change all of the ports that you used to plug in with your phone. So all of these things are a way to sell more products. Women are really going to have a moment here in the 1920s. This is still part of the first wave of American feminism that had its high point with the 19th Amendment. The women who came of age after the Great War benefited from the advances that their mothers and grandmothers had fought for. They had the right to vote, and many looked to higher education as an option if they had the money. Fashion reflected the rebellion against traditional female roles. Young women of the 1920s abandoned the corset. They wore looser fitting clothes, including shorter skirts. Uh, side note here, some of the, the fashion uh, changes of the 1920s actually started during the war as an effort to conserve cloth. Still, in 1919, skirts were typically six inches above the ground, but by 1927, they were at the knee. 
the flappers are the image that we tend to associate with the 1920s. These are the bold young women who smoked cigarettes in public. They wore makeup and cut their hair. They wore short skirts. They went to speakeasies and drank bootlegged alcohol. They drove in cars with boys without chaperones, and they were the ones driving. So, it, I want to pause here for a second on the story of flappers simply because I want to emphasize the fact that most women in America would not have called themselves flappers. Even most young women of the 1920s wouldn't have called themselves flappers. The flappers really are a small group of in sort of uh, trendsetters. They are the influencers of the 1920s. And that sort of trickles down into the rest of society to the point where you start to see some older women modifying their fashions or cutting their hair or maybe putting on a little bit of makeup. But definitely the, the flappers are um, the, the tip of the sphere, the spear of change. Dating is also a new thing. Uh, previously, the ritual was courting. You would spend time with someone to see if you wanted to marry them. But dating is something different. It's much more casual. You go to the movies without in any intention that you might marry this person. Now, it's possible, but that's not really the goal of the outing. Finally, sports. It becomes acceptable for women to be physically active. So at the turn of the century, women had participated in certain leisure sports like bicycling, but now more active sports like basketball and tennis. It becomes accept acceptable for women to engage in those sports. Jazz is a uniquely American form of music. It begins in New Orleans and is a synthesis of black rural folk traditions and urban dance entertainment. It had traveled with migrating music musicians to St. Louis and Kansas City uh, with the Great Migration, and musicians and migrants then carried it to Chicago and New York City. The blues and jazz scene carried the story of African-American struggle through slavery and discrimination into the 20th century, but it also became popular with white musicians and white audiences, and many played within the so-called black and tan clubs of New York City, like the Cotton Club. Related to the growth of jazz is the Harlem Renaissance. Harlem it was a predominantly black neighborhood in New York City, and the word Renaissance means rebirth or rediscovery. And this is really a period of cultural blossoming for African Americans, and in many cases involved the bolder treatment of controversial topics like racism and discrimination and segregation. So this is an artistic movement of writers and musicians and poets and painters. So People like Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes and Claude McKay celebrated African-American culture, and it's really going to have a profound impact on the future of the United States. In fact, later on, when we get to the civil rights movement of the 1940s and 1950s, we're going to draw back to the traditions of the Harlem Renaissance as part of that origin story. Related to the Harlem Renaissance is the so-called New Negro Movement. The Harlem Renaissance's focus on cultural and artistic accomplishment grew out of a common sense of identity, growing power, and distinct self-expression. In addition, the celebration of Black culture found a much different expression in what came to be called Negro nationalism or the new Negro movement, which promoted black separatism from mainstream American life. Marcus Garvey was a Jamaican national who insisted that blacks had nothing in common with whites, and he urged African Americans to remove themselves from white society in order to cultivate black solidarity and what we might consider to be black power. <laughs> 
Garvey, however, faced fierce opposition from some black leaders, including W.E.B. Du Bois, who called Garvey, quote, the most dangerous enemy of the Negro race. In 1923, Garvey was convicted of fraud for overselling shares of stock in a steamship uh, steamship corporation, which he had founded to transport American blacks to Africa. So coming back to our questions to think about, what were the components of the liberal image of the 1920s? A lot of this is played into the background of the booming economy. So Americans have this high standard of limit of living. We see the the wealth of consumer goods available, and it's this huge economic impact that that changes American society. So whether it's the flappers or the Harlem Renaissance or the Jazz Age, this is the image that we seem to connect with when we think of the 1920s. So stay tuned for part two of the 1920s.